come to a few choruses and hymns we're going to sing together just to prepare our hearts for worship as we are gathered as our first one this morning as we are gathered Jesus is here one with each other Jesus is here so let's sing this out as we commence our time together fount of every blessing tune my heart to sing thy grace this is a beautiful one let's sing it together Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Let's sing this out.
Let's finish our choruses with Be Still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Let's all stand together as we sing our opening hymn after the introduction, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Let's stand as we sing together to God's praise.
Amen. What a great, great hymn that is. Let's take a moment just to gather our thoughts. Let's come before God in prayer. And let's just ask for his blessing upon each one of us this morning. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for these words that we have just been singing together, both in the hymns and the choruses that we have sought to use to lift our hearts to you in worship and in praise. Father, we readily acknowledge that we come to a God today who is worthy of our praise, a God who has been so good to us and has provided everything that we have needed, a God who has been so gracious to us and who has shown us abundant mercy. For, Father, if it had not been for that mercy, we could have been cut off out today and a lost eternity. And yet we're here in your presence and we're here to praise you and we're here to renew our love and our loyalty to you and to bring you our worship and adoration. Father, we thank you for a new Lord's Day morning. We thank you for all those who have been able to gather out with us. We come to pray your blessing upon each one of us, whatever the needs that we might have today. Father, we thank you that though you're a God who reigns in heaven, we thank you that you're only a prayer away. And today we can come and commit everything into your tender care. We know that you're a God of love and a God of great grace, a God who has shown toward us abundant mercy and a God who is waiting and willing to pour out his blessing upon us. But Father, we realize that you are a thrice holy God. And so we come to you, we confess our sins individually and collectively. We come and to pray that we might have clean hands and a pure heart so that we might be able to stand on holy ground and so that we might know the truth of the words we've already been singing, be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Father, we thank you that we're in your presence. We thank you that that has been made possible through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that one day he left the very splendor of heaven to come into this world of sin. And though he had no sin of his own, we thank you that he went to a cross and died in the sinner's place. He was our substitute, for he took our place and died the death that we should have died. We thank you that through his death, on that cross at Calvary and through his resurrection from the dead, we come to you knowing with absolute confidence that he is able to save to the very uttermost all who will come unto God by him. Bless each of us as we gather in this new Lord's Day morning. Father, we pray that you will bless not just those of us who are sitting in this building, but those who will join us live on Facebook, just as we have come from different homes, so too do our needs differ. But we thank you that you're a God of sufficient grace, and we pray that that grace might be extended to each one of us today. Father, remember those who'd love to be here, but they can't for various reasons. Some have been in hospital and they're recovering at home and we commend them to your gracious care and pray that very soon they'll be back again to a full measure of health and strength. Some are elderly now and they find themselves under residential care and we commend them to you. And Father, we pray that in their latter years of their journey that they might know and feel that underneath and round about them are the everlasting arms of God. Father, we come to you quietly, humbly, very reverently, for you're a great God, 
Your greatness is unsearchable. Your ways are past finding out. But meet with us today. Bless Dave as he speaks with the boys and girls, blessing the children's church and crash. We thank you for our boys and girls and young people who already have been in Sunday school and Bible class. Father, we just thank you for all who have gathered together here just now. We commend ourselves to you. Commend to you every other meeting just like this up and down our land. And we pray that God will bless his people, that he will reveal himself to those who as yet do not know him, that they might come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all things we pray that the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, will be greatly magnified. And all these things we ask in and through his precious name. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to ask Mark if he'll come and make the necessary announcements, please. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our morning and breaking of bread service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who will be listening in live this morning on Facebook, and I've noticed a few visitors in with us this morning, and we welcome you to our morning service. After the ministry of God's word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember our Lord Jesus Christ as he has commanded us to do. If you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord this morning, we invite you to remain behind as we break bread together. David Selwood will be bringing the children's message this morning. Ali and Lindsay Farrell are on Children's Church and Julie Corbett, Rachel Shaw, and Alicia Baxter are on crest duty. Then this evening, our prayer meeting at 5.45, preceding the gospel service at 6.30 p.m. A pastor continues the series, Lessons from Dr. Luke, and the title this evening is Three Important Lessons. There will be a praise group practice after the evening service this evening. Uh, new members will be made very welcome. Then the youth fellowship at 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., and that's for all secondary school age young people. Then the announcements, the incoming week on Tuesday of our toddler group at 10.30 a.m. The good news recommences again on Tuesday evening at 6.45. And the ladies' fellowship at 8 p.m. The speaker for the ladies' fellowship is Avril Edgar. And all ladies will be made very welcome, especially those who have not been before. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study. And then on Friday, our Bible study at 12.15 p.m. Then on Friday evening, the youth club again from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Uh, and that's for year eight to year 12. And they're still looking for helpers for this work. And if you feel that you can help anyway on a Friday evening, please speak to our brother Marcus Corbett. Then on Saturday the 7th of October, the Torch Fellowship. And the speaker and singer on Saturday is Mr. Mark Templeton. And that's at 2.30 in the church hall. Next Lord's Day, the 8th of October, Sunday School and Bible Class at 10 a.m., 10.45 the prayer meeting, and then 11.30 the morning service and breaking of bread. Children's talk next week will be Pastor Taylor. Children's church will be Timmy and Caroline Carson. And Johnny and Jenny Finney and Claire Bird will be responsible for crest duty. Then 5.45 our prayer meeting, preceding the gospel service at 6.30, and then the youth fellowship at 8 p.m. in the church hall. Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. Then the craft class that will recommence for those that go to that. That will recommence on Monday, the 9th of October at 7.30 p.m. Church Hall, but I'll mention that again next week. Just a letter to read out from the treasurers this morning. The treasurers would like to thank most sincerely all those who contributed so generously to the missionary convention offering. The total amount received was £10,277 and 50 pence. Your generous giving will continue the spread of the gospel to many needy souls. Thanks again, and God bless the treasures. Just also mention that Hope for Youth Ministries uh, magazine, our prayer letter is now in the hall on the way out. You can lift that and follow all the work with Hope for Youth Ministries. Also, uh, the Siemens Christian Friends Society, if we, we do this every year, and their leaflet is now in the hall as well. So if you follow that work, and collect the items that is required. There's a list of everything that's written on the sheet. 
It's now in the hall, and if you make sure that that's returned by the 29th of October, anything that's being brought in, if you leave it in bags, over on the right-hand side as soon as you come in through the church building. Just a letter to read out. Uh, Tommy and Shirley Shaw wish to thank everyone for their prayers during Tommy's illness. We both really appreciate all the phone calls and visits, and we thank God everything went well to God be the glory. So that's a wee letter from Tommy and Shirley. Just one more thing to read out. I would like to express our sincere sympathy to Lynn Adamson and family on the death of her father during the week. May the family know the loving arms of Jesus around them at this difficult time. And for those who have lost loved ones over the last few months, we continue as a church to uphold you all before the Lord in prayer. That's all the announcements, and they're all made subject to the will of the Lord. We're going to ask Dave if he come now uh, to bring the children's talk, and if all the boys and girls could make their way up to the front pews. Thank you very much. So everyone hear me now. So I've got lovely new shoes on. What do you think these shoes could be used for? Yep. Mountain biking, maybe? <coughs> Sorry? Hiking. hiking. But hiking up where? Mountain. Mountains. Do you know the Bible is full of mountains? We read about different mountains in the Bible. Jesus ascended from one of the mountains and he's coming back to the mountains and he went to the same mountain just before he was crucified. Anyone name the mountain that's really near us or one of the mountains that's really near us? Has anyone done any mountain hiking near Newcastle? Yep. Yeah, can I have more adults help me? Kevin, can you give me a mountain? A mountain, please? Donard. Donard. Anyone heard of Donard? If you've been to Newcastle and you're walking on the street, you see a big mountain. Well, I, when I go up the mountains, I really like to go up the mountains. I love it because it's quiet, and I can sit down with my Bible and just pray and spend time with no distractions around because my life gets really, really busy. So in my rucksack, which I have here, and I'm going to share with you some of the things that I take up on the mountain. Now, the first one, and most important one, is the Bible, because it's important to read. Now, these are really good for walking, aren't they? And they're very comfortable, and they grip well, and it's important that as we live our lives that we, if we are Christians, we walk with God. And I'm going to read from John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So when we're walking, it's, it's good to walk with friends, isn't it? Who likes to walk with friends? And as you're walking along, yeah? you really find it nice and the time goes by so quickly because you're talking all the time. Now, I have to have some helpers now. So can I have two volunteers come out, please? Two volunteers, quickly, there's lots. Everyone's gonna get a go. So I need to show you these. C can you come up? You two come up and hold these. Come on. come on, Jack. So what do you think these could be used for? Hiking, but what in particular? Do you eat them? No. no? Okay, so what do you do? You what? Climb up or climb down. And I use them more for climbing down, thank you. So these are very good because when you're coming down, my knees aren't so good as what they used to be. And I need to go like that on the way down. Now they do extend a bit, but they're your, <laughs> your sort of size, so you can walk back with Walk back with those, see if you can, if that helps you. You're going to fall over with those, no? No? I think they will help you, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would help you. Thank you very much. Do you know what? As Christians, you can take a seat there. As, as Christians, sometimes we fall. We don't do exactly what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. And although we have the Bible to support us and our church to support us, sometimes we fall and we need help. So that's the first things. Now, let me see what I have to get next. Oh, yes. We've done that. We've done that now. Yes. Oh, I need some help here. 
So next person's up, please. Two, please. Who can help? Come on, Hannah. Come on, help, would you? You can take that. What's that? Can you read it? Bio. Bio freeze. Now, some of you that have played a lot of football will use this, but it's for muscle strains, and sometimes you get muscle strains. Mia, come on up here. What do you think those are? Plasters. Plasters, yeah. So we might need a bit of help from time to time when we're walking the mountains. Sometimes we might fall over and we need plasters to put on, or we've got a muscle strain. Thank you very much. As Christians, because we fall, we need fixed. And we need fixed quickly, because you couldn't leave a bleeding wound unattended. And sometimes as Christians, when we do things wrong, say things wrong, do things wrong, then we need help from God. And walking with God is very, very important that we don't break that communication between us and God. Now, ah, yes, we're going down the row here. So I need, I need, I need a bit out here. Right at the bottom here. Here it is. Oh, next to you can do the little one. Can you come on up and take that? Come on up. And that's a bit too big for you, Jessica. But just what do you think? What do you think that is? Sun cream. And what's that? A coat. So in Northern Ireland, as you know, it's, you don't know what weather you're going to get when you go up a mountain. So you might need sun cream when it's sunny, and you'll definitely need a good raincoat when it's rainy. Yeah. That's to protect us, yes, because we can get very cold up a mountain if we don't have the right clothes on. And we could burn, we could come back down from the mountain and we could be bright red by the time we get down. So that's very important to have protection. And the Bible helps us with protection because in Ephesians chapter 6, we have what's called the armour of God. And it's very important to put on things as Christians. Just like we get dressed in the morning to go to school or to work or whatever we do, we need protection. Now, oh, this is the best part. Oh, come on, Sophie and Josh. Come on up. This is what I really like going up the mountain for. <laughs> now, would you prefer the chocolate or the banana? Would you prefer the chocolate or the banana? <laughs> so, what do you think we need chocolate for? I also carry jelly babies as well, but I forgot to buy those, all right? So, but I do like a banana sometimes, okay? So, what do we think we need that for? I come down a mountain and I'm going to go up another one and I think, oh, how on earth am I going to make it up that mountain? What do you think I might use this for? Energy, yeah. Have you got plenty of energy? Have you? Have you? Then you don't need that then. Oh, <laughs> you can take that home and share that with your brother. Unless you want the banana as well. <laughs> so, yes, it's important. I've done what's called the seven sevens, and it took me 13 hours and 40 minutes. And I needed energy. And I had about three packets of jelly babies and lots of chocolate when you get the energy low. Now the Bible says, us as Christians, sometimes we don't feel too good. Sometimes we need a boost. Sometimes we've been so busy, like the end of a holiday Bible club, we are ready to lie down for a week. But the Bible says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's just like God has protected us, he also gives us renewal and strength to go on. Okay. Two to go. Okay. I have here. What do you think this says? Who's on the, who hasn't said anything? Abigail. What's that? A notebook. And I like to write notes. Sometimes, as you know, some of you know I write songs. So I would write some songs and I would... Just sit there looking around. This is one of the verses I wrote. Your creation amazes me. Each new part of the world I see. You spoke and it came to be. 
This is marvelous to me. And those of you who have climbed mountains and you look down on the wonderful view of creation, and it is wonderful, and we can just sit there in awe and just watch around us and watch what's going on in the created world. But it's good also to record in our notebook the answers God has given us to prayer. It's important to pray, but it's also important to write down so we don't forget to give God the praise and the glory for what he's done. The last thing I have. Oh, where'd that go? It must have fallen out. Oh, oh, it's on the floor. Jack, put the microphone down. A whistle. What do you think we could use whistle for on a mountain? Any ideas? What would you need? If you needed to do what? Sorry, say it. Your dog, yes. If definitely, you can whistle for your dog to come. But this is more to draw attention to yourself. Maybe you're injured and there's a search party looking for you. You can blow the whistle to draw attention to yourself, okay? Now, as we've gone through our talk, which we just finished, all those things that we talked about are very, very important when we walk with God through difficult times or good times. It's important that we remember. But it's important for us to remember that God wants you to pay attention to what he's given to me today to pass on to you. So all those things, whether you feel you're discouraged and you can't go on, you need the chocolate, you need that renewal to go on, or if it's just the fact that you want to study more with God and set time aside for God as you are working with him. Now we're going to sing, My God is so big, so strong and so Pick this one, because it's the only one chorus I could find with a mountain in it. <laughs> the mountains are his, yeah? So we'll come on up and join me, and we'll sing together. And the rest of the congregation can stand, please. And we'll... Spread out a little bit so you don't hit each other when you do. He is so big. All right? Make sure you spread out. Thanks to Dave this morning, and it's lovely to welcome you all. I'm only guessing today, but I see a lot more people with Jean Carswell than is normally here. I assume family from Australia, is that correct? You're all very, very welcome today as you come and you join with us. Now, let's turn to the book of Jonah again. We've been making our way through the book of Jonah and we're going to turn back to Jonah today. Jonah chapter 3. And we're going to read 
at verse 1. But as you look it up, let's just bow together for a moment in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day, for the privilege we have of being here, for those who have been able to come and join with us, even those of Jean's family who have traveled many, many miles to see her. We pray your blessing upon each one of us, whatever our needs might be just now. But we think of those who mourn today, and we think of Lynn and Hugh and the family circle, as Lynn's daddy is buried later this morning. We just pray that you would draw near to her, to the family, and that you would comfort her and sustain her and the family circle in the days that lie ahead. We know, our Father, how difficult it is whenever loved ones are taken from us. So we pray for all who mourn this day. We pray that God's blessing would rest upon them. As we come to your word to read it, Father, may you just open up your word to us that there might be something today that would speak into our hearts, maybe for the very first time, and be the means of drawing out our hearts and our lives after you. Bless us, we pray, in the Saviour's name. Amen. Let's turn, read together in Jonah chapter 3, in the first verse of Jonah chapter 4. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went on to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Amen. God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts. You know, for the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at this servant of God, Jonah, who I have termed the reluctant missionary. And we've been looking at some things concerning him in the opening three verses of Jonah chapter 3, where Jonah finally goes to Nineveh. Not only had God been gracious and compassionate to Jonah, despite his disobedience, but also God had a heart, a heart of love and compassion for the people of Nineveh who were at that time living under the judgment of God. We noted three very simple things. We saw Jonah's second commission. The word of the Lord came on to Jonah the second time. Sometimes when we make a mess of our lives, and sometimes we do, we feel that that's the end of it all. God cannot, God will not use someone like me. When I think of what I did, when I see the mess I've left behind, God cannot ever use me again. Well, that's not true. If like Jonah, we repent of our sin and we turn from that sin and we get back into fellowship with God again, 
God can speak to us the second time, the third time, and sometimes he has to speak to us many times in order to bring us back into the place where we are useful for God. We noted, secondly, Judah's solemn charge. The word of the Lord came unto Judah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city. Preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And what God said to Jonah at that time was vitally important because he was not only giving Jonah another opportunity, he was giving him the great responsibility of bringing his message to the people of Nineveh. And God said to him, preach on to it the preaching that I bid thee. He's going to a strange place. He's going into a very difficult situation. He's going in amongst people who will want nothing to do with the message God has given to them. And yet God said to Jonah, preach on to it the preaching that I bid thee. Whether we be in the pulpit or whether we're teaching children, young people, or whatever our ministries might do when it comes to the handling of God's word, those under our care, our responsibility is the same. It's our sole responsibility to be faithful with the Word of God. And it's a responsibility to direct people to Christ, not to direct people to us. Not for people going out and saying, didn't he bring a big message this morning? But going out and saying, isn't Christ a wonderful Savior? Because that's what it's all about. And the third thing we noted was this. We saw Jonah's sensitive conduct. Verse 3 says, Jonah arose, went on to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah now, having disobeyed God, steps out in obedience to the commission that God had given to him. Not only sensitive to the fact that he had feel God in the first place, but now sensitive to the needs of this great, great city who were living under the judgment of God. You know what Jonah did? It's something that every Christian should do every day, every week. We go into the world to live out our Christian lives. We go out to make a difference, to make an impact on the lives of those people that we live with, we work with, we speak with on a daily basis. Sometimes we refer as Christians today to the Great Commission. But very sadly, sometimes that Great Commission has become the Great Omission, simply because we're not what we should be as we try to reach the world. But here we come again now to Jonah. We're going to pick it up again And this morning, I want to show you Jonah's message to the Ninevites. You see, despite the fear of the people, and there were many of them in the city, and despite the enormity of the task that God had given to Jonah, Jonah did what God said. He got up, he went to Nineveh, and I want you to know Jonah's message. And I want you to see the response of the people of Nineveh to everything that Jonah shared with them. Now, we'll not get all of that done today, but let's think first of all about the challenge of the message, the challenge of the message. We've already noted that whenever God instructed Jonah to go to Nineveh, God said to him, preach everything that I give you. Preach everything that I give you. Now, that would never be an easy task. It's not an easy task for any servant of God in any part of the world today because the reality is that there are many people who just don't want to listen to what God has to say. Many people today don't believe there is a God. Many people today aren't interested in anything spiritual, and I fully understand that because I once stood in that place. Do you know that just this particular week, one of the TDs down south said that there was another group of supremacists who have thus arisen, and she said it was those who actually believed the Bible. Not amazing. 
that if you carry a Bible, you read a Bible, you believe a Bible, that somehow you're a section of society that should be cut off. You have nothing to offer. I want to tell you today that the Bible has everything to offer. It has so much to say to all of us about every aspect of our journey through life. Dave has been reminding us step by step of the things that Christians need on their journey through life. And here's Jonah facing the challenge of the message God had given him to preach. Jeremiah, one of the Old Testament prophets, was taken aside by God, Jeremiah 26. God asked him to share the message, God's message, with the people of his day. And Jeremiah spoke to a people who were wayward, rebellious, people who had cast themselves off from God. They weren't interested. And God said this to Jeremiah, not a word, not a word is to be withheld. When Jonah or when Jeremiah went with the message of God to these people in his day, it almost cost his life. That's how it is sometimes in the world in which we live. There will be missionaries out serving the Lord in various parts of the world, and they'll do it individually in little groups. They might do it in bigger groups here, there, and yonder, and some of them are under threat because of the message that they declare. Jonah's going into a city a vast city, the city of Nineveh. He's going across into the midst of a people who knew nothing about God. And do you know what God said to Jonah? Preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah's stepping into the unknown. He's going amongst the people who wouldn't want to listen. And yet God said, Jonah, every word I tell you, you deliver it as I've given it to you. Did Jonah do that? Well, let's look at this message for a moment recorded here in Jonah 3. Because first of all, we can see the diligence of Jonah. Nineveh was an extremely large city, not just in size, but also in population. I've said before in our introduction, historians tell us that at that particular time that Nineveh may have had a population of some 600,000. But interestingly, the Lord says in Joshua 4.11, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. God refers to the population as 120,000 souls. But you know, whatever the number of inhabitants and the size of the city, this was a vast task for one man. Could you imagine me saying to you someday this week, you meet with me on Monday and I'm going to give you a bag of literature and I want you to take it and have others in the boot of your car and I want you to go down to Belfast and I want you to start at West Belfast and I want you to work your way through the city, avenue by avenue, street by street, door by door, and I want you to tell every single one of them that they're living under the judgment of God. Would you go? Some have gone. But when you and I think of that in a city that we know well in our own land, can you imagine what it was for this man heading out into this city with a message that God had given to him? But the message God gave him was short. And it was simple. And it was soul-searching. And it was also authoritative. You know why? It was God's message. It was God's message. Look if you've got a Bible at verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and none of her shall be overthrown. No introductions here. 
Jonah hasn't had time to go in and sit among the people or stand in the corner and have an open air and talk about the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and all those attributes that we associate with him. Jonah comes into a city, he cries, and he says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. See, these people were in a very difficult position. They were facing an awful prospect, and Jonah was moved to preach God's word to them, and Jonah cried. He cried. Do you know the sad thing about the people of Nineveh at that time? The clouds of God's judgment were already hanging over them. And they didn't even know. Do you see when Jonah entered into the city? It was three days to get through the city. The people were just getting on with life. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, just the same. Things to be bought, things to be done, actions to be taken. And there's the cloud of God's judgment over this vast city, 600,000 people. And they didn't even know. And Jonah's so concerned, he comes to them. And he cries. And he says, you 40 days. And the judgment of God is coming. Can you imagine that? Yet we look out at our world today and see the great spiritual need of the people who live in it. I ask you one question, and I've asked my heart this this week all the time. Should we not be concerned about these people? And should we not be concerned about the awful prospect that they're facing? You see, the people we rub shoulders with daily, they're people we live with. They're those we work with. They're those who are part of our extended family. And here's the thing. They are in danger today of being lost. They're going to die without a saviour. I've met people over the years in ministry. Even at places around the graveside or perhaps heading back to my car after doing a funeral, people will come up to me and they'll say, Pastor, I wish I had shared the gospel with them. But late. They're gone. Where they're gone, I don't know. You don't know. But you see, the thing is this. Child of God, what are we waiting for? We're not under commission to share the gospel. This isn't new. This has been going on for 2,000 years. When Jesus stood on the hilltop, Dave talked about mountains, and there he looks at his own disciples and he says to them, go ye out into the whole world. Bring the gospel to people just like the Ninevites, just like the people of Jeremiah's day, just like the people in our day. For we have the only message that can change them, and we have the only Savior that can satisfy them. Why are we so reluctant to share the gospel? Why so reluctant to speak to others about Christ? Child of God, some of us might say today, well, Pastor, I wouldn't like to admit it or acknowledge it, but I'm a wee bit reluctant because it's, it's not that I'm ashamed of the message. It's just the people I work with. Well, I would suggest today, if you're ashamed of the message that has won your heart to Christ, there's something wrong. And others will say to me, but Pastor, hold on a moment. I have already thought about this often. But I have household salvation and I'm 
happy about that. I'm happy for you. I genuinely am happy for you. And there are multitudes of people sitting here today and they're happy for you too. But you know what? Their hearts are breaking. Because of so many in their family circles still not saved. You cannot rest in your laurels and thank God for my family if there are families all around you that you know and you love and you see the need of compassion and you don't do something. I'm always... Challenged by the words of General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, spoke to a group of young men and women preparing themselves for Christian service. And the last thing he said to them was this. I only wish that I could hold you 10 seconds over the pit of hell. And when you see the reality of what it means to be lost, then you'll be ready for service. The diligence of Jonah. God says, arise and go to that city. Cry against it. Second time, Jonah gets up and he goes to this city and he turns around and he cried. He said, 40 days, none of us shall be overthrown. That tells me something of the diligence of Jonah. But secondly, we see the deadline of God. The deadline of God. The message Jonah preached was simple, straightforward, but it was solemn. And there's no way around this this morning. We can't leave out passages of Scripture because they don't seem to suit our way of thinking. This was a solemn, solemn message because it was a message of judgment. And God was giving these people the opportunity to hear and to heed his word. And he was giving them an opportunity to turn from their sin and to come to him in repentance. But God had sent the deadline. Jonah says God's going to send judgment in 40 days. 40 days. In other words, both the preacher and the people knew that the time was short. That the judgment of God was imminent and that the deadline would soon be passed. The city was going about its daily duties. They didn't realize, as I've already said, that the clouds of God's judgment had already gathered over the city. But you know, God and grace could have immediately, but he gave them 40 days to put the matter right. I wonder if you're here today and you've never, ever yet become a Christian. I wonder if God said to you, listen, you've got 40 days left in your life. What would you do? What would I do? I grew up with me and I have folks in my family would turn around and say... 40 days, I'll spend the rest of it sitting in the pub. I'll spend the rest of it doing this, that, or the other thing. 40 days, I'm going to use my time well. I'm going to ask you this morning if God said you had 40 days left. Would you grasp your opportunity to get saved? Would you prepare for eternity that is to come? Would you turn from your sin and prepare to meet God? They say, Pastor, listen. What about it? What about it? The truth is that you and I today don't even know if we're guaranteed 40 days. That's what's about it. Do you remember the people in Noah's day? Do you remember that preacher of righteousness away back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis? And of course, we're told this man preached for 120 years. 120 years. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he preached away and he preached away and he built an ark and the people laughed at him. They hadn't even seen rain. 
And Noah preached away and told them to be ready and built the ark and built the ark until the ark was built and the rains came and God shut Noah and his family in and shut the whole world out. That a hundred and twenty years of listening to a righteous man bringing them the word of God, it mattered nothing. They didn't listen. You say, Pastor, I've had 120 years of a quarter but ahead of me. Yeah. But here's the thing. There's a man in the Bible we read of, and the Bible calls him a rich young farmer, a rich farmer. He was doing well in life, and you know what he said? He said, I'm going to build bigger barns, and I'm going to expand my territory. I'm going to do everything I can, and I'm going to build it all up until the day. What day? The day when I say to my soul, soul rest up and be easy and I'm going to enjoy the rest of my life. And God said, thou fool, tonight, tonight, your soul is required of you. Forty days is short enough to hear God saying tonight, ah, but you say, these are Bible stories I've far longer left in my life than that. Have you, really? Do you know that with certainty? Because the Bible says there is a deadline that already has been stretched out before us and we can't pass it. And you know what it says? It's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. The problem with the death issue is we don't know when it'll come. You know, I look at you almost every week, most of you. I'm sure some of you are tired looking at me. But you and I both know that some of you are not saved yet. But what we don't know is how soon either me or you will be carried out into eternity. You could have 40 days. You could have 40 minutes. And therefore it's time the Bible says to seek the Lord. I encourage you if you're not a Christian today, come to Christ. Come to Christ. Don't let anything or anybody deter you from taking this step of faith. Yes, there might be battles ahead, but there'll be many blessings. Yes, there will be times when you won't feel the courage to go on, but God will give you the courage that you need. Yes, listen, come to Christ and be saved. For the hymn writer says, O sinner, God's patience may weary some day, and leave thy sad soul in the blast, my willful resistance. You have drifted away over the dead light at last. That's the reality of life. That's the position you may be in right now. Friend, the deadline of God is sitting over every head this morning. I'm just pleading with you. While you're still in time and not in eternity, give your life to Jesus Christ. And many other things we'll finish next time. But the diligence of Jonah, he went to the city and he cried. He told him the truth. The deadline of God, it was looming. And the people needed to do something about it. Let's pray. Father, We ask simply today that you would help us to hear your word. We thank you that you're a God of grace and mercy and a God of great compassion, not willing that any should perish. So we pray that you'll just minister tenderly to our hearts for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's sing a lovely hymn in closing. Great God of wonders, all thy ways are worthy of thyself divine, and the bright glories of thy grace among thine other wonders shine. We're going to sing the first two verses of this hymn together as we close. First two verses.
Father, we thank you that you are a God who pardons even when we stray, when we rebel against you. We can honestly say today, who is a pardoning God like thee or who has grace so rich, so free? We pray, our Father, that you'll bless those who leave us just now, take them safely home. For those of us who wait around the table, we pray you'll meet with us there in the sea of your precious name. Amen. Amen.